You guys, my mind is blown. When we use the atonement to do the thought transformations and we pluck out, and we call it mental gardening. My husband came up with that name for me because I was trying to explain to him like what I was doing with clients. And I was like, I need a title for this. Give me a title. And he said, well, it sounds like, because I told him we're plucking out the weeds of the negative and, and false beliefs that we have. And we're implanting the truth of the spirit. The spirit is giving us new memories and new beliefs and new positive emotions like flowers. And he said, call it mental gardening. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Come Off Conqueror show. I'm your host, Bonnie. And this video, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I have a little bit of a office organizational project that I'm doing. And while I was in the middle of this mindless work, it occurred to me that I should share with you um, something that came to me while I was bearing my testimony today at church and something that I felt um, Heavenly Father really wanted all of you to know. And that is the topic of how the atonement, Jesus Christ's atonement, works to cleanse our thoughts and this idea of thought transformation and how it is more powerful when we use Jesus Christ's atonement to help us do that. So <laughs> uh, let me explain kind of where this came from. The, as you guys probably remember, I talk a lot about thought transformation in a lot of our videos. So the idea, this is like a, if you've heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, they use the same technique in that uh, therapists do. Life coaches use this. Hypnotherapy uses this. It is just a principle that has been around for a long time. You may have heard um, Byron Katie talk about it. Um, Brene Brown. Uh, oh my gosh, all of a sudden that guy's name is totally escaping me. The guy who made meditation super popular. Um, the guy, uh, oh my gosh, I've completely forgotten. Oh my God. Joe Dispenza. Okay, I knew I was going to get it. So anyway, this, this thought transformation idea is talked about a lot by a ton of different experts in neuropsychology and uh, just psychology in, in general and coaching and in all of these different disciplines, okay? So as I have been studying more and more about psychology and how to turn our thoughts around, um, I have started to see some connections with our spirituality. And so let me first explain what is thought transformation for those of you who don't know. Okay, so the idea is that our minds are pre-programmed from the time we are very little, um, even in utero, according to some neuroscientists, um, to have certain belief systems and paradigms and perspectives of the world around us, right? The whole idea of nature versus nurture, how much of this is inherited and just our um, what we're born with and how much of this is nurture, right? It's a little bit of both. So from a nature standpoint, we we know from science has proven right that we receive cells from our parents right when a fetus is created it receives cells that are replicated that go through this replication process at this rapid replication process but it gets cells from both the mom and the dad right and those cells are coded with dna and those that dna is coded with the color of your hair, your eyes, your predisposition for certain illnesses, like, um, gosh, uh, any of those inherited illnesses, all of them are escaping me all of a sudden. But even our like predisposition for heart disease and diabetes and cancer and all those things, we can have a predisposition for also depression, ODD, ADHD, we know through neuroscience that a lot of these things are passed down. Now, there are some people who believe 
that not just those diseases and those physical things are passed down, but they also believe that we have passed down predispositions for trauma responses. So there is a study that was done. I can't remember how long ago, but it was the mice study where they um, inflicted some mice with some trauma and they ended up having a trauma response. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, I'll have to find it and link to it later, but they had a response, like a fear response. And so every time the, um, kind of like Maslow's dogs, right? Like if you remember every time they rang the bell, they would feed the dog and it would make them salivate, right? So then eventually you ring the bell and the dog salivate. It was that same kind of concept, but they did this with fear and with trauma. Those poor mice. And so even though the trauma, they weren't abused after the, um, the trigger, they still had the response. What they found, which is really interesting, is that their offspring, the babies of those mothers, also had that same fear response when given that same trigger. I think it was like a noise or something like that. And the mice would get shocked, but the babies didn't get shocked. But they still had that same fear response. And you know what was interesting is that went on for seven generations. Seven generations of mice had that same fear response. So some of our trauma responses that we have, fear, anxiety, um, OCD control, eating disorders, um, nightmares, night sweats, you know, all these different things that come to us from trauma, some of that can get triggered by our own trauma, but it can trigger the past trauma that has been inherited by you too. So bring this all together, nature versus nurture. So you also have trauma from your own life, right? That happens as a child. We know that you don't have that filter to discern truth from uh, lies until you're about the age between ages seven and nine, right? That's neuroscience has proven this. That's an interesting number too. Think about that around the age of eight. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> Moving on. But the interesting thing is that everything that happens to you up until then gets absorbed into your mind as truth. So when they say that babies and kids are sponges, they literally are. They have proven that everything gets captured into that brain and that subconscious mind and everything gets looked at as truth. So what did we learn as a child? Well, if you were a child that grew up in an abusive situation or an unsafe situation or war or as a refugee or um, had a parent that had a serious medical illness or died from an illness, right? You were gathering all of these interesting paradigm, um, paradigms and perspectives about the world around you that may or may not be true. They're true to your brain because it's the experience that they lived, right? And on a survival mode, they had to make these things true. So for example, if you were a child who had an abusive alcoholic parent, you might have learned when dad gets home, get the heck out of there. Don't stick around. You know, if if you walk, if he walks in the door and you can see that he's kind of walking all funny, you know, this is not going to be a safe environment. I better get out of here, get my siblings and go, right? While then later on in life, you might also see someone who's acting like this, but maybe they're not alcoholic. Maybe they have a disability, but that could trigger in you a fear response. See how these things that happen to us as kids and throughout our entire lives become a part of the way we view the world. And so we can get triggered again by seemingly unrelated events and unrelated situations, but because they trigger the same emotion that we had as a child or when that um, e that traumatic event occurred, if we trigger that same emotion, that trauma is re-triggered, okay? They have proven that our emotions are tied to these events. So back to the atonement. How does the atonement apply, apply in all of this? Well, the thought transformation theory 
suggests that you can retrain your brain that when an emotion comes up, you stop, identify the emotion, you identify the event or the first you identify the thought and belief that is tied to that emotion. Oftentimes there's lots of belief systems and thoughts that that's called a belief system is a bunch of thoughts that come in when you're, when that emotion is triggered, right? And you can go through those and say, is this true? Right. If you're a Byron Katie fan, you would say, how do I know this is absolutely true? Can I know that this is absolute truth? And if you're in your heart space, like what I teach my clients, thanks to Robin Johnson's teachings, when you're in a heart space, you can tap in and find the truth really quickly. And you can know, is my perspective right now true? Is the thought I am having absolute truth? And there may be an element of truth there. But the beauty of finding what the truth is, you can know. And then it, the theory continues to go on that you tie it back to the event so that you can then, as you clear the thoughts and you turn those thoughts around and you find the truth to the negative thought that you're having and you find the new positive emotion that you're having, you end up healing that traumatic ex- experience and reducing your PTSD ultimately and your and your fear responses and your trauma responses. So many of you who are my clients who have been through this process with me, um, you know that there's quite a few steps here that I take you take you through. Um, and I do feel like I should teach all of you how to do that. Um, so I invite you to a free workshop um, on January 25th at, um, shoot, now the time escapes me. I think we're going to do 6.30 p.m., <laughs> 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, over Zoom, where I'm going to teach you this process of stopping and thinking about your thoughts, finding the truth, turning them around so that you can release the emotions and the triggers. um, And it will no longer, that event will no longer have a hold over you and you will no longer have that trauma response. It's a process and it takes some time to do. Brain retraining is not fast. It takes 60 to 90 days to rewire those neural pathways, neural pathways to have this new pattern of thinking. Okay, back to the atonement. We know from the atonement in the scriptures that what is God asking us to do? Have every thought back to him, right? Think of him, think of him, right? Have pure thoughts, have kind thoughts, Um, Jesus came and he said that even a man, if he, um, he says that scripture about adultery, that I say that it's not just enough to commit adultery, but even him who lusteth after a woman hath committed adultery in his heart already, right? So he's saying, pay attention to your thoughts. Your thoughts should be on me. It's not just about our hearts. Our hearts, if our hearts and our thoughts are in alignment, that's called coherence, Right. When they're in alignment, we have harmony. And when they're in alignment with truth, who are they in alignment with? God. God is truth. The light, the way, right? The beacon on the hill, the truth. He is truth. And when we can align our thoughts with truth, we are aligning our thoughts with Him. So, how do we do that? We transform our thoughts. We have thought transformation. We go from a state of negativity to a state of positivity when we find that truth. We're using the atonement in this process. And it's more powerful when we include Jesus in on that process, which is why heart-centered coaching is so powerful. Why? When we can tap into our heart which is our connection to the light of Christ, which is where that light of Christ lives. Our hearts are the connection to God. Our hearts knit in unity, right? There's a scripture in Ezekiel. Y'all that my husband showed me. Okay, turn if you have it with you. Ezekiel 36, okay? The whole chapter is amazing. But if you look at this chapter, 
in terms of psychology and our hearts and what we're trying to do when we knit our hearts with God, right? He says that he wants our hearts. We want to become one with him like he is with his father in heaven, right? Our hearts, when we use the atonement, which means at one mint, it means coming unto Christ and becoming one with him and one with God, one with them in purpose, one with them in our hearts. When we look at this chapter of Ezekiel 36 in that light. Oh my gosh. It's like mind blowing. Okay. And he says, um, if you look at this in terms of what, what abuse has done to us. Okay. Think about that. Thus saith the Lord God, because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side that ye might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen, ye are taken up in the lips of talkers and are an infamy of the people. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills and to the rivers and to the valleys and to the desolate wastes and to the cities that are forsaken, which became prey and derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about. Hang on. How many of us feel like we are desolate? We are numb. We have nothing left in our hearts when we've been abused. So many people, and there's actually a psychological reason to that. I won't get into it right now, but there's a really cool study about where in your brain you feel a spirit. And it's, um, I guess I will tell you, um, that part of your brain is damaged when you're abused. So it is hard, literally, to feel the spirit when you've been abused. So we feel desolate, right? We feel like we are a waste place. How many of us felt like we were dirty? We were while it may not have been our sin, we feel the sin, right? We feel what he is saying here, that we are a desolate waste that was prey to a heathen, right? He continues to say, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy, have I spoken against the residue of the heathen? Hello, prophets and pastors and all these pe people have preached so heavily against abuse, right? And God himself talks about how awful it is, right? The It would be better for a man to be hung with a, a noose around his neck than to hurt a um, a child. Like, because if he hurts a child, it'd be better for him to be hung than have to endure the wrath of God, right? Think of that scripture, okay? Um, he says, he keeps going, which have appointed my land unto their position with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. Prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel and say unto the mountains and to the hills and to the rivers and to the valleys and to all of you to bland. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury because ye have borne the shame of the heathen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I have lifted up mine hand Surely the heathen that are about you, they shall bear their shame. But ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to the people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. He's saying, heal and branch out and go heal other people. For behold, I am for you and I will turn unto you and ye shall be tilled and sown. I will do mental gardening in your minds and in your hearts, and I will help you turn those thoughts around. I will pluck out the weeds of these false negative beliefs, and I will plant in you a flower of righteousness and healing. He goes on, I will multiply men unto, upon you and the house of Israel, even all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited and the waste shall be builded. Your heart that was desolate will be inhabited by God. And the waste that was there will be cleansed and will be healed and it should be filled with light. He keeps going. I will multiply on, upon you man and beast and you shall increase and bring forth forth. And I will settle you after your old estates and you will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. As we do this work, healing all the emotional baggage, letting it go, turning it around, we will know God. 
and he keeps going. I, I'm going to skip ahead to where he says. Um, mm, okay. Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they shall defile it by their own way and their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanliness of a removed woman. Again, abuse. Poured out my fury upon them. Again, he is not going to, he's not going to stand for it, right? He keeps going, keeps going. Uh, where is it? Where is it? And in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them and ye shall dwell in the land I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God and I will also save you from all your uncleanliness and I will call for the corn and I will increase it and lay no famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and increase the field that ye shall receive no more reproach and famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and loathe yourself and you will forsake it. Keeps on going to say forsake it. And then he talks about cleansing us. And then he says in verse 35, this land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Y'all, he is saying that our hearts can become a garden of Eden and will become fenced. What are boundaries? Fences, right? That let people come and go. You guys, my mind is blown. When we use the atonement to do the thought transformations and we pluck out and we call it mental gardening my husband came up with that name for me because I was trying to explain to him like what I was doing with clients and I was like I need a title for this give me a title and he said well it sounds like because I told him we're plucking out the weeds of the negative and, and false beliefs that we have and we're implanting the truth of the spirit the spirit is giving us new memories and new beliefs and new positive emotions like flowers. And he said, call it mental gardening. He's such a genius. <laughs> Smart guy. This is what I can't wait to teach you on the 25th. We're going to go through this process of thought transformation, and we're going to connect into our hearts so that we can feel the truth of what God wants you to know so that you can pluck out the weeds and implant the flowers, and you can make your heart a garden of Eden. He has promised us from the beginning of time with the garden of Eden and from the very first man and woman that he will always be with us. Always. We just need to do the work. We need to transform and repent and use the atonement and turn our hearts to him. But when we do that, I 100% firm, firmly believe that we can be healed. And when we let go of the emotional anchors, this emotional baggage that is literally weighing us down, we will soar spiritually. And when we soar spiritually, every other aspect of our life becomes better. Everything else falls into place. When we put God first, all things fall into their proper place or drop out of our lives. This one of my favorite quotes by President Benson. You guys, I promise you that when you do the work and you go to therapy, you go to a life coach, you go to a hypnotherapist, you do whatever you have to do to clear out the junk and to let go of those anchors, you will come to know God. And when you come to know him, he will show you your path. He will show you your purpose. He will show you who you are to him. Your self-confidence will grow, which will then give you a better career and a better relationships with your family. Just everything will be multiplied. I have seen it in my own life over the last couple of years as I have been going through the work. This freedom that I feel and these incredible miracles that I see on the daily and the revelations I receive 
are so powerful. I will never go back to a desolate place because I am letting him create a garden of Eden in my heart. I can't wait to meet with you on January 25th. I'll see you all there. The details are in the link below.